So we are uh, continuing our series in Acts, and, and today we're going to focus on the, the proclamation of the gospel in the book of Acts, and, and sort of revisit what we think of when we think of the good news. Okay, so this is something which is at the very core of our faith, at the very core of what it means to be a Christ follower, to be a Christian. And, and I think where I want to challenge us is that sometimes we kind of preach a partial gospel, right? And our gospel's too small. And really, to, I want to give us this vision, this idea of the gospel as being something that, that we can join God on. And it includes, you know, all things, that it's a big gospel. And so, what is the gospel? And, I, you know, I, you don't need to shout stuff out or anything like that, but to think about, well, what is if I was asked to share the gospel message with someone, how would you do that? If you're having a conversation out for coffee with someone and they say, well, what do you guys really believe? Anyways, like, what is the gospel message? What's at the heart of your faith? You know, a lot of times when we think of the gospel, we, we sort of tend to think of it as the sort of the minimal requirements uh, you know, to get into heaven when you die, right? It's like life insurance. It's like your learner's license, right? The, you know, not, not the driving part, but where you just have to write the test and, and you sort of figure that that's all that it is. And we've kind of, um, and it's true that, you know, Jesus died for us, right? That he died for me. And that, that by accepting Jesus, you know, you can have eternal life. But that isn't, that's, that's a partial gospel, because it's, it's far more than that. And a lot of times in our culture, there's these different ideas of the gospel that get sort of presented, that kind of you see. Um, and, and a lot of times it's this gospel of personal needs that, well, you know, like, okay, well, I'll follow Jesus, I'll accept it as long as, as, long as he kind of gives me what I want, right? And I'll go to a church as long as it meets my needs, and then once the church stops to meet my needs, then you'll maybe go elsewhere. And, and so it's, it's part of this consumeristic sort of idea that, well, there's this religious smorgasbord of churches, and, and you can kind of go to whatever church building, and when people are gathered on Sunday, and you can go and you can sort of see what they have, see what they're serving this week, right? Um, and you kind of go and, and, well, that church down the road, they have something better, and then you just start going to that church. Right? So this is sort of this, this perversion of the gospel, which sort of makes it sort of mean that it's just their personal needs. And another similar one is this therapeutic gospel, right? This idea that, well, you know, the gospel is really, you know, like the gospel according to Oprah Winfrey or something like that, where the gospel is meant to kind of give us sort of this balanced, healthy life, um, you feel loved, you feel significant, you feel validated and heard, um, and, and, and that's all that it really is. And if you don't feel validated or heard, then again, you start shopping around. And then probably one of the biggest perversions of the gospel is the health and wealth gospel, right? That God, you know, that you, you, you come to Jesus, and why? Because he's going to make you rich, Right? Um, now, we don't preach that, like, well, some churches preach that. Um, we definitely don't preach that. But sometimes the way the evangelical church talks about the gospel almost sometimes borders on this. It's sort of not, the, you know, not quite health and wealth, but, you know, that if you, if you come to Jesus, if you follow Jesus, then, you know, all your problems will go away. And you'll have a successful, strong marriage. Um, you'll have a successful, strong business, right? Because, well, God wants to bless you, right? And if you're following him, that obviously that all that will work out. And now the challenge, of course, comes is when your business isn't as successful. And then you think, well, gee, why is that? Am I not living the faithful life? Did God, you know, miss that part about how he's supposed to bless me? How about do Christians ever have marital problems, Right? Like, no, like, not every Christian marriage is going to be this, this beautiful thing. Now, you know, but part of it is that all of these sort of different sort of perversions or, or presentations of the gospel, they all tend to focus on me, 
right, on the individual. And now Scott McKnight, he wrote this book, The King Jesus Gospel, a few years back. And he says this, he says, I think we got the gospel wrong. Or at least our current understanding is a pale reflection of the gospel of Jesus and the apostles. I believe the word gospel has been hijacked by what we believe about personal salvation, and the gospel itself has been reshaped to facilitate making decisions. The result of this hijacking is that the word gospel no longer means in our world what it originally meant to either Jesus or the apostles. Well, that's a bold statement. Now, he has some good you know, other scholars to back him up. Tom Wright, who's uh, another you know, major New Testament scholar, in his book, What St. Paul Really Said, you know, said that the gospel is not a system of how people get saved. The announcement of the gospel, or the preaching of the gospel, results in people getting saved. But the gospel itself is a narrative proclamation, the preaching of King Jesus, that Jesus, the crucified and risen Messiah, is Lord. And so, you know, it's not that our gospel, you know, sometimes how we think of the gospel is totally wrong. It's only that it's partially right. There's more to the story. And I think this is what both Tom Wright and, and, and uh, Scott McKnight and others sort of are highlighting that it's, it's, we need a bigger picture of the gospel and what God is doing. And so the challenge with all these different ways of understanding the gospel is that they individualize it, right? They make it the Jesus for me gospel, right? That it's just about me and, you know, whether my health or my personal satisfaction or, or whatever. But it, it's really that the gospel is far more than just about me. It's about what God is doing in this world, it also sort of takes it out of its context and, and, and abstracts it. You know, in this, you know, from the biblical and historical context, one of the things that, that you'll notice that whenever the gospel is preached in the book of Acts, it's never just starting with, you know, the, the here and now, but it also highlights what God has been doing through history. And there's lots of scripture that are quoted as being fulfilled in Jesus and all this. So it's something which needs to be connected, you know, to what God is doing in the real life history of his people in this world that we live in. And so this is something which is similar where, I don't know if this is a word, it destorifies it, right? That, that when you think of it, like the mission of God or the missio Dei is this idea of what, that the culmination of this, what God has been doing in the world was, was sending his son Jesus, and that this story continues in the life of his church, and that's what the book of Acts has been highlighting all the way throughout. And we're trying to tease this out as we go through Acts, is how is God still at work through his people, through the power of the Holy Spirit? And so we're part of this larger story. But when we just sort of abstract the gospel and say it's just about me and, me and God and just about you know, you know, personal salvation, that we kind of miss that picture. And it also, and this is probably one of, the, one of the saddest realities, is that it creates this unfortunate break or gap between salvation and discipleship. Right? That it, it sort of almost creates them as two separate things. So, okay, people are saved. You know, you put your hand up, you make that decision, you know, whatever sort of process, and then you're saved, and then sometimes, well, yeah, discipleship is an option, I guess. But really, if we, if we understand it as well, you're following Christ. And yes, there's this moment where you decide to follow Jesus, right? Where you decide, to, you repent, you turn 180 degrees from all the other stuff that you focused on, and you start following Jesus. But that's not the end of the story, right? That's just the beginning of the journey, and the journey is one of a life of discipleship where God transforms us and changes us into the image of his son and we live life, you know, as, as God intended it to be. So this morning, uh, you know, we want to sort of try to look back at Acts and try to understand what this, this larger gospel is. 
And so, you know, we could look at Jesus' teaching for the gospel, right? But we're in Acts, so, you know, it's still Jesus' teaching, but uh, we're going to focus more on that. We could also look at the gospel according to Paul, right? And, of course, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, he, he highlights it. He says, for what I received, I passed on to you as first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to, to Peter and then to the twelve and, and so on. And Paul kind of gives a summary of the gospel. You notice that there's no period after that Christ died for our sins. But the, the sentence actually is the first, it's one sentence in the Greek where from you know, right from verse 3 all the way to verse 9, it's one sentence, and, and this is the full gospel. The other thing that he noticed from Paul in this passage, he says, well, what I received, I also passed on to you. And that the gospel wasn't something that, that, you know, that Paul just made up, but it was part of the received tradition, the received sort of proclamation of the church. And so today we're going to look at the gospel in the book of Acts, because here we have the story of the early church. And, and so we can see how, you know, throughout it, how these different individuals preach the gospel and sort of what it contains. So, so the sermons show how the first Christ followers understood it, right, and how they preached it. And now there's a number of uh, passages, you know, in Acts which sort of summarize that. You know, we've, there's Peter on Pentecost, which we already looked at. Um, when Stephanie preached a few weeks back, uh, Peter at the temple. And that's what we're going to focus a little bit more on today. But then you have the, the sermon or what Stephen said when he was facing martyrdom. Uh, you have Peter to Cornelius. Uh, you have Paul in Antioch, where he kind of gives this presentation of the gospel, and then Paul in Athens. And so there's actually about 13 different speeches in the book of Acts. And these six are ones where it's sort of focused on the, the gospel being presented to people who are sort of outside the church, right? So this is sort of the, these examples um, of, of where they actually summarize the gospel in their day. Now, I remember doing this paper when I was a young wee lad, um, and you know, the, like I'm, it was during my undergrad, so that's like, you know, that's a long time ago. Um, and I did it on the kerygma of the early church. The proclamation. Kerygma is a Greek word that's used for so the, the preaching of the gospel, the proclamation of the early church. And one of, of course, the significant sort of scholars who did a lot of work on this, and he worked in the previous century, uh, you know, like, you know, he died around 1927, was C.H. Dodd. Okay, so he was a British scholar, a uh, New Testament scholar, um, and he sort of summarized uh, the proclamation by six main points. And you can tell by how small my print is on that first slide that, yeah, there's a number of, of, of points. And I'm not going to go through them all. And actually, I'm going to summarize them more into three different ideas. But he sort of talked about, when he looked at the preaching, that the age of fulfillment has dawned in Jesus, right? That this has taken place through the birth, life, ministry, and death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. By virtue of the resurrection, Jesus has been exalted to the right hand of God. The Holy Spirit in the church is a sign of Christ's present power and glory. The messianic age will reach its consummation in the return of Christ. Right? So right now we're in this in-between time between the first coming and the second coming. Um, and then, then an appeal is made for repentance with the offer of forgiveness, uh, the offer of the Holy Spirit, right? to be filled with the Spirit, um, and, and of course salvation. So this is how he sliced and diced it in terms of understanding the gospel, you know, as presented throughout the book of Acts. And today I want to sort of, you know, highlight three sort of different ways or three sort of, I want to summarize his points in three main points. And probably the first one is that the gospel is always God-centered, right? It's always, you know, focused on, the, it's, it starts with the big picture, right, that you have that this larger mission of God. So even in today's passage, in verse 13, you know, that, that here Peter doesn't say, well, God, you know, has done this, but it's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, 
That even by the way he refers to God, he's tying this message of salvation, this message of, of the gospel to, you know, the Old Testament God, the, the God that created the world, the God that called the patriarchs and the matriarchs and, and the God who worked through, the, you know, for thousands of years through his people. That he understands the gospel story is Jesus resolving the story of ancient Israel. That, yeah, it is all about Jesus, but Jesus is the culmination of what God has been doing. So it's sort of something which is part of this larger story of God. Right? And that's sort of important to sort of see it in this larger context. Because then it sees what, what God is, what, you know, the beginning, and then it also continues and sees how it's going to end. And that's something which, you know, I know we talk about going to heaven a lot. But if you've been around Greenfield and heard me talk about it, I'll say, well, it's really talking about, you know, the new heavens and the new earth, right? This wonderful vision that we get at the end of the book of Revelation, where you have heaven coming down to earth and God dwelling among his people. You know, that, that the goal isn't that we kind of, you know, get to be disembodied spirits flying around in the clouds with wings and eating Philadelphia cream cheese, right? That's not our goal, right? But rather that it's this embodied existence in our new resurrection bodies with God here on earth where God dwells with his people in the new Jerusalem. And, and the thing that you see always because what this, this God-centeredness and this focus is that there's this, you know, often... They are quoting how the scriptures have been fulfilled, how the, this, this faithful God who called Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, that how he has been working faithfully throughout history, and that this is, this is all happening according to, to his purposes, and that it's fulfilled in Jesus. So even in this passage, you know, that here talks about how the Messiah would suffer, right? And this idea of a suffering Messiah comes from Isaiah 53. So there he's alluding to this whole idea of the suffering servant that'll come and die on behalf of Israel and die on behalf of everyone. He, he sort of also talks about the prophet like Moses, where in Deuteronomy chapter 18, that, that you know, here you have Moses saying that, well, I'm, I'm gonna, God's going to send you another prophet like me in the end days. Right, and that he will show you, you know, how to live. And, and so you see this is explicitly quoted and saying that it's fulfilled that this prophet like Moses is Jesus. And he blows Moses away. You know, he's not just a prophet, but he's prophet, priest, and king, and Lord, and Savior. And then, of course, it, it you know, and this is a passage that is often appealed to again and again and again throughout Scripture is the promise made to Abraham. You know, that here in this, in this sermon, Peter, you know, quotes this, that, you know, God called Abraham, you know, and that it was through Abraham that all the families of the earth will be blessed. And, and this is something which then we see is fulfilled in Jesus. And to continue to be fulfilled through his people, through the church, right, as we live obedient lives, following Jesus and blessing all people, you know, through Jesus. And that's something which, you know, Paul highlights in Galatians and a number of places in the New Testament that that is sort of a fundamental idea, you know, of the gospel, but that, that God is fulfilling this promise made to Abraham uh, or Abraham at that time and that this now is fulfilled in Jesus and continues to be fulfilled through his people. So it's God-centered. And of course, it is Christ-focused as well. The, the, the gospel, you know, that obviously everywhere in the book of Acts where, it's, where you have the preaching of the gospel, it talks about Jesus. It connects the story of Jesus, however, you know, in, in not just his death, but in his life his ministry, his teaching, 
you know, and how that was, of a, you know, that's a piece of a one cloth, that's one cloth that then is culminated in his death, but then not just his death. It's not just that Jesus died for us, but that he was resurrected to new life and that he's coming back. Sometimes I think that we've reduced the gospel to Good Friday. We've reduced the gospel to just the cross. And while the cross is at the center, at the very heart of Christianity, that Christianity is more than just the cross. It's not just Jesus crucified, but it's Jesus crucified and raised to new life. And as our, our current Lord and Savior. In this passage, you see Jesus proclaimed as God's servant, which is, again, drawing upon this Isaiah 53 idea. You see uh, Jesus referred to as a holy and righteous one, whereas the Messiah, the Christ, which, you know, sometimes when we just refer to Jesus as Jesus Christ, we forget this idea that Christ isn't his last name, right? But that's the title, that's he's the Messiah, the long-awaited Messiah of Israel. And yes, I will take a drink. <clears throat> and then significantly, and I think that this is one of the um, you know, most clearest passages in the sermons in Acts, in chapter 2, verse 36, this is in, G, in, in Peter's proclamation at Pentecost, where he says, therefore, and this is in verse 36, therefore let all Israel be assured of this, that God made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. That both Lord and Messiah. Not that we can just pick one or the other. And then, of course, all these sermons in the book of Acts, including you know, chapter 3, uh, they're response-oriented. That there's always sort of some sort of call, summons to respond. You know, and enter the gospel story and join God on mission. So it's not an individualistic summon. Well, you know, come and, and, and you know, have your sins forgiven and be, be good to go. But instead, it's, you know, come and follow me. Like I think of Jesus when he, you know, in all the gospels, he's presented as, as summoning his followers and saying, you know, repent, you know, and, and come follow me. You know, you know, join me on this life of yours. And that starts with conversion, but then it continues on throughout our whole lives. And that our whole lives are supposed to be lived for Jesus and following him. And following Jesus means that we're kind of living the life that we figure that Jesus wants us to live and to be concerned for the things that Jesus is concerned about. And there's sort of, you know, always some sort of, you know, call to repentance, you know, which is saying that, well, you know, how you're maybe envisioning life in your life, that something needs to change, perhaps, right? Because repentance, this, this idea, you know, metanoia is, is to change your direction, change your way of thinking, that you were going this way, and now you're going this way. And you're following this guy called Jesus, right? Who's Lord and Savior. Um, and so, you know, repent and be baptized is another way that, that Peter highlights it in, at Pentecost. You know, and then they, they dunked a whole bunch of people that day. But, you know, here this idea of repent and be baptized is that, you know, and Stephanie gave this great sort of emphasis. She got on her little soapbox in her last sermon here and talked about, well, you know, like, Baptism is sort of a, a, a is an act of obedience to Jesus's command. You know that the, it's talking about the initiation uh, right into the body of Christ. You know now you can be a Christian, you can follow Jesus without being baptized. But I guess the question that I would say was, well, why would you want that? You know that here Jesus says, you know, repent and be baptized. Peter says, repent and be baptized. Paul talks about, you know, it as well. And it's sort of this act of obedience. And, and maybe it's awkward, 
because you've been following Christ for quite a long time, and now you're just kind of, wow, yeah, I should have got baptized when I was younger. But who cares? Does anyone here care? Is anyone going to sort of laugh at people if they get, come and get baptized? If they're, okay, just say no. You're not going to, okay? <laughs> you're not going to, right? So I encourage you to you know, seriously consider it. That, you know, and, and that there is this response. And sometimes it's a response of recommitment. Because we've kind of been just trucking along. And, and you know, and, and, and maybe we haven't been, and it's not, you know, living our life as, as, as maybe God would want us to live it. And so that's where it's time to, you know, where we talk about recommitment. You know, and at the end of the service, we'll have time for prayer. And if, you, and if you want someone to pray for you, and just that, you know what, I, I feel I really do want to start living my life and following Jesus. And all of that entails, right? And we don't always know what that means. And it's probably a good thing at the beginning we don't know the full, full thing, right? God gives us enough to respond to, you know, in the, in the time that we have. You know, so these are the sort of ideas about how the journey starts, Right? To, to repent, to turn to God. Right? To have faith is another major way that, especially the Apostle Paul talks about it. And this life of faith is something that, that is, you know, and I don't want to oversell it and say, oh, it's the best thing since sliced bread. But, but it is. That doesn't mean that everything's going to go great for you. It doesn't mean you're not going to get sick that your business isn't going to struggle, that your marriage will, have, will not have any troubles, or that you'll get straight A's in school, even without studying, right? Oh, the kids are all at youth, so it's a good thing they didn't hear that, because that's not true, right? They're all at retreat. But, you know, this idea that it just means that, that you, you have a purpose to life and that, that Jesus is your companion, and as you're following him, that he will walk with you through all things, even through the valley of the shadow of death, right? That he's a good shepherd that'll, that'll you know, guide us. Like this last week in Core 3, we, we dwelled on, you know, John chapter 10 and, uh, and the, the good shepherd passage, right? This idea that God, um, you know, has sent his good shepherd and Jesus is one that will walk with us and will guide us and sometimes give us a little whack to get back on track. And he'll also keep us safe, you know, from the wolves and the other creatures and all this. And, and, and so this is sort of the life of discipleship is one which is, which is really the, living life the way that it was intended to be, that God created us to be in relationship with him and with one another. And so the life of discipleship is one of, of following Jesus through thick and thin, and letting him work in and through us. And the consequence of living life and following Jesus is salvation. That those who respond to the gospel, it refers to them as being saved or forgiven and justified. It refers to them uh, you know, as, as their sins may be wiped out that you have the forgiveness of sins and justified and so on. And, and so the point is, isn't that it's just a one and done a thing that happens at the beginning. But if you're following Jesus, if you're living the life, you know, as, as a Christ follower, that you're going to have to go back to that well quite a bit, right? And ask God for forgiveness. You know, so yeah, the, the beginning of the journey is the reorientation of your whole life. But then throughout, there's all these course corrections, where you kind of need to continue to rely on the grace of God, you know, for every single day. But we're given the gifts of God's Holy Spirit to go with us, to indwell us. And then we're incorporated into God's new community, right? The, the, the church, the, the people of God, to walk alongside with us. Right? So there is an individual component. Right? Obviously, we have to make that decision. But we don't make it alone. And we don't walk alone. 
One of the images I, I really like from the book of Acts when it describes the, the first sort of description or term that's used to refer to the, this, this sort of early Christian movement, they refer to it as the way, as following the way. And what I like about that is that it's not just talking about making a decision, but it's following a way, of, of, it's a way of living life, right? And it's a life lived, you know, centered on God's mission, plans and purposes, you know, which is, should blow our minds, right? That God wants and invites us to join him on mission, you know, in this world. It's a life lived in faith. Right? In the saving death and the resurrection of Jesus and Messiah, both Lord and Savior. And it's a life lived faithfully. Right? You know, that it, it, it faithfully loving God, one another, and our neighbors. Now that's, you know, echoes our mission statement. And I say that a lot. I don't apologize for that, though, because I think that really is at the heart of what it means to be a Christ follower, right? Is that, that this is this life that's centered on God and what he's doing in the world and that he invites us, he calls us, you know, to join him. And that's possible through what Jesus has done on the cross, that we can be saved, we can be redeemed, we can be reconciled, we can be healed, all these sorts of rich terms that talk about what God has done in Jesus that that you know, can be ours as we recognize him as Lord and Savior. And then that leads to a life, a Holy Spirit-filled life of loving God and growing in that relationship with God, loving one another and growing deeper with one another, bearing one another's burdens. Like really loving, like you know, signing up for meal trains is a very practical way. You know, and, I, and I, we dare not minimize just simple things like that, how we can come alongside one another, right, and live life together. And then loving our neighbors. You know, living out the gospel in our neighborhood to the people at work, people at school, and living that life and showing them what, who Jesus is and telling them who Jesus is.